Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor George Perry, who is Professor of Biology and Chemistry at the University of Texas in, at San Antonio. Professor Perry is recognized in the field of Alzheimer's disease research, particularly for his work on oxidative stress. Perry's research is primarily focused on how Alzheimer's disease develops and the physiological consequences of the disease at a cellular level. He is currently working to determine the sequence of events leading to damage caused by and the source of increased oxygen radicals. Welcome, George. Well, thank you very much, Gil. You have done some really fascinating work in the area of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Before we get into it, I just want to get a general sense of, um, you know, kind of prevalence. So uh, dementia uh, is sort of a superset of number of different diseases, right? Correct. And what's the general prevalence of uh, dementia in the U.S. and uh, and in the world in general? In the United States, over 5 million people, close to 6, have uh, what would be classified as Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. It's an age-related disease, and uh, it's responsible for about 60% of the dementia of the aged. Okay. The risk of having Alzheimer's disease prior to the age of 60 or 65 is really quite low. Mm -hmm. But after then, after age 60, the incidence and therefore the prevalence increased dramatically. So that while it's only maybe one or 2% at age 60, at age 85, it could be 30 to 50% of the population mm. suffers from Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And do we see any, um, any difference or variance in prevalence rates across, the, across different countries or regions? Yes, but it's not so easy to dissect this. Okay. Reason being that dementing illnesses are so sociologically uh, driven. Yeah. Uh, dealing with expectations, ability to diagnose people, et cetera. There are indications, but a lot of countries who felt that they didn't have Alzheimer's disease at all, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, China said it didn't, which is not true. <laughs> China has a, a significant number. I know in India, there there's some indications it could be lower, mm. but I think those have not been uh, well substantiated. Because if you don't have... Um, highly trained neurologists that can perform tests. Um, it's really hard to diagnose them. Yeah. Because there can be other issues that causing dementia. Uh, dementia can result at early ages, such as people have had a lot of head trauma mm -hmm. or uh, other types of conditions can cause uh, dementia. So uh, I guess the diagnosis rate would have increased over time. So it's difficult for us to say if the, if, the, if the disease rate is increasing with time, right? We would not have picked this up maybe 
30, 40 years ago? Uh, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. I mean, some indications, certainly realization of Alzheimer's disease has increased greatly in the last 30 years. But that's related to greater ability to diagnose, appreciating that not everybody that becomes aged has cognitive decline. So it's complicated. Um, there are some indications that it may increase, be increasing, and it could be driven by some lifestyle changes, which is greater obesity, uh, greater amounts of diabetes. But it's difficult to sort that out. You know, more the big difference is that people live longer than they used to. Not so much that people died at age 30, which is not true. Um, the, if you look back a century ago, the average age that people lived to was like 35, 40. But that's a combination of people living to 70 and dying as, and children. Right. right. What happens now is very few, in most countries, children don't die. And people live at least to the 70, but they also live beyond 70 into the 80s. That's a very common feature. And when people live beyond the age 80, their chance of having Alzheimer's disease is very high. Right. So that extra, every time you add five extra years to life, mm. if nothing else changed, you double the chance of having Alzheimer's disease. Right, right. Yeah, so... My um, understanding is that the, the early therapies uh, sort of targeted uh, the, the plaque or the amyloid beta uh, aspects, um, deposition or whatever in the brain. And much of those thera therapeutic targets uh, or therapies didn't really work, right? Correct. The, actually, the very earliest therapies were based on the model that was very effective for uh, Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And that was um, using neurotransmitter supplementation. In the case of Parkinson's disease, people take L-DOPA. It doesn't cure the disease, but it provides sym symptomatic benefit for several years. And that's what was hoped to be the case for acetylcholine. Yeah. And those therapies are the currently uh, approved ones. Aricept and others yeah. work by that mechanism. And then subsequent to that, people worked on trying to develop a disease-modifying agent. And that is to change the course of disease, either to cure it or to delay it significantly. And those mainly focused on amyloid. And so far, they have been complete failures. Hmm. Not, not slightly successful. Even the one that's considered to be somewhat successful, uh, which Biogen may get approval for, if you look at what the data is, it's very marginal. Right. Yeah, I remember Aricept from my Pfizer days in the 90s. Um, and uh, is that still something that is going? The amyloid? Uh, you know, the, still the, the Aricept? Oh, Aricept. Yeah. They're making tremendous amounts of money out of the drug because it does have some benefit for patients. Yeah, yeah. Mild benefit, but sufficient that it's justified to be taken because the drug is not terribly expensive and it does not have major life-threatening side effects. Right. And your hypothesis is, is, is quite different. So the, the oxidative stress um, that, that seems to, um, if you have the disease, that the stress itself actually happens a lot earlier before we actually see um, much of the known symptoms, right? Is that is that the idea? Correct. Actually, oxidative stress, if you're looking at abnormalities with it, with mitochondria, with metals, with oxidative damage, start. you can start seeing this when people are in their 30s and 40s. Mm. And I have no idea if that variation is related to them eventually developing Alzheimer's disease because I only look at people at one time point when they've died. The, um, the same thing for the amyloid. The amyloid changes also start occurring during middle age. Mm -hmm. So we think that all of these are related to normal physiological responses of uh, the brain. Yeah, so the amyloid is... Uh, is uh, essentially correlated with oxidative stress? 
inversely correlated. Inversely correlated. Okay. Could you, so yeah. it's, yeah, it, w this really surprised us. When we started doing quantitative studies of the amount of oxidative damage versus the amount of amyloid, looking at it by staining, either within cells or in plaques or anything, any other measure, and we always found an inverse relationship. And that led us to think that, well, instead of the amyloid causing oxidative stress, that the amyloid was actually an antioxidant response to it. And then we did subsequent studies showing that amyloid bound uh, copper mm -hmm. and that, that when it binds copper, it uh, redox silences it, it or changes its redox properties significantly. So inversely correlated meaning, so when you, if you have high oxidative stress, you see less amyloid? Yes. If you compare different people, yeah. you'll find that those people with the highest amyloid have the lowest oxidative stress. So during the course of Alzheimer's disease, a person having it, late phase Alzheimer's disease, oxidative stress is extremely low. Okay. And uh, the highest levels occur early during the disease. In fact, just prior to clinical onset during mild cognitive impairment is the highest period. And the amyloid continues to increase during the course of the disease. Slightly different depending on your APOE genotype, but it still tends to increase. Mm. And so, so, the, so the, the hypothesis is that when oxidative stress happens in the brain, amyloid production is sort of a defensive mechanism Exactly. Okay. In other words, it's much like inflammation. It marks something that's abnormal. Yeah. So it's marking that there's a problem, but it is not the problem unless it's overstimulated. Hmm. So it, it can be like very much like inflammation. Inflammation is part of a repair re response, but it also can cause damage along the way. So, so yeah. we've been trying to look at that mechanism for amyloid for a number of years, dealing with mitochondrial dynamics because mitochondria contain amyloid. Yeah. And also in terms of metal redox chemistry, which is more complex than what I said, it, the redox silencing, that's the part we've published. But actually when amyloid binds copper, it changes its property significantly. Mm. And it looks like it converts it into some type of an antioxidant. But even that's more complex than that in some recent studies we've done because there um, is conversion to very unusual uh, metal redox states. Okay. So, so do I understand this correctly, George? So, if, so when the brain has oxidative stress, it starts to create amyloid and it's a defensive mechanism and it actually reduces oxidative stress. So as you Correct. progress in time, you have less and less oxidative stress. But once the amyloid is produced, uh, it, it tends to aggregate and, and continues to increase. Is that what you're seeing? Correct. Okay. Okay. Correct. The, the aggregation of the amyloid or the multiple conformations, no one really understands this because it's described in a whole bunch of different ways, mostly stories that are made up. The um, Amyloids in general, and there are at least 30 different amyloid, they're almost always response proteins. Yeah. And they, uh, when they get overproduced, they have the ability to form different conformations. But that's not unusual. A lot of proteins have multiple conformations. And I think in this case that we don't understand, that means that you have a protein that can have four or five different types of activity, depending on its conformation. And one of those activities is to be able to bind metals. And that's true uh, for a lot of amyloids. It's not unique to Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Uh, the prion protein also binds copper, Copper changes redox properties, and so do some others. Okay. Um, oxidative stress also, like saying reducing, it's really hard to know what oxidative stress is doing during the disease either. It's mainly an indicator that there's some kind of imbalance. Hmm. And, and what's the mitochondria connection here? How, how does uh, yeah. Mitochondria, uh, well, number one, amyloid beta occurs in mitochondria. It's been shown for a number of studies. 
Uh, amyloid toxicity in cells is dependent on functional mitochondria. Yeah. Um, am, uh, as parenthetically, so is prion protein required. If you don't, cells don't express prion protein, they're uh, not susceptible to amyloid toxicity either. Um, and um, mitochondria are the primary source of oxidants or oxidative stress for almost every cell. Hmm is uh, because the uh, oxygen you breathe is basically being used to oxidize food just like a car is oxidizing gasoline yeah uh, we oxidize the hydrocarbons in our food and turn them into carbon dioxide and mitochondria are the major place that this is occurring and w when it's occurring it, it's not pure just like in the case of the car hmm. it's not a hundred percent efficient and there's several things that happen. One is that some of the, uh, the oxidation products of it are not just pure water and uh, carbon dioxide. Yeah. They're partial, partially reduced water, excuse me, oxygen, which is like superoxide, which then can become hydroxyl radicals and can attack. Instead of just oxidizing food, they oxidize your body. Mm. And this is a major part of cells in life as we adapt it to living with oxygen, which is so toxic, is that our body developed a number of defenses. So it's not like uh, this is a new thing. It's been, oxygen's been on the earth for uh, close to a billion years, ever since plants formed. And there's been oxygen and we adapted our metabolism to oxidize things and get more um, energy out of them, you know, an extra 20 fold more energy by oxidizing all the way to carbon dioxide. Yeah. But we also have the negative side is that that oxygen also reacts with us. And that's what oxygen defenses are. Mm. There are hundreds of oxygen defenses, hundreds and hundreds. Because if you don't deal with this, you die. Right, right. So simplistically, so if you have some kind of abnormality in the mitochondria, then that energy conversion process results in some stress to the mitochondria. It will, you will lead to production of superoxide. Yeah. And the superoxide will be modified into other types of oxidants that will attack everything. Right, right. And uh, normally, there's a fairly low level of this, but when there's mitochondrial problems, you can have a much higher ratio, just like a car when it's not tuned. Well. Maybe that doesn't exist anywhere in <laughs> computerized cars, but uh, I have an older car, and it, if it isn't tuned right, you end up with all these horrible smells coming out the, out the exhaust pipe because you have partially combusted things. Right. And we work the same. And uh, if it, when you have more of this, so mitochondrial is a primary source of radicals, but in order to have oxidative damage, you also need to have catalysts to cause that damage. And uh, the mitochondria for its normal metabolism uses copper and iron. Mm -hmm. That's how it actually oxidizes your food. Mm. But so does oxidative stress and oxidation of products use copper and iron. Trace amounts, it only requires it does not require increases in copper and iron in order to have a problem. It, cause, it requires um, relocalization, reorganization. Mm. So the mitochondria found uh, elsewhere in the body, is it exactly the same as found in the brain? I don't know if exactly the same, but pretty much the same. Okay. They all are organelles that have properties very similar to bacteria. There are major problems, and that's something we've published a lot in uh, about mitochondrial problems that they, uh, you see uh, mitochondrial breakdown products accumulating within neuron, neurons at risk of death during Alzheimer's disease. So you see mitochondrial DNA all over the cytoplasm of, uh, of large neurons. Yeah. Uh, you see... Um, changes in size of mitochondria. You'll see mitochondria not so well dispersed within the cell. 
And a lot of this has to do with um, microtubule density and transport. Mm -hmm. It also has to do with fusion fission properties because the fusion fission proteins are altered in uh, content. And those are things that we were the first to document. Yeah, yeah. Things like so is mitochondria abnormality something that we can test for? Yeah, you can test it even in peripheral cells. The um, fibroblasts and other, w we've studied and other people have studied uh, blood cells. Yeah. Uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and they have some of the same mitochondria abnormalities you see in the brain. Hmm. And so, so conceivably, you could develop a test that in the 30s people can take that may impute a probability that uh, they could progress into Alzheimer's? Yeah, potentially. I don't know it because I haven't checked people in the 30s <laughs> to know that. I've only checked people when they had Alzheimer's disease. And the mitochondrial thing, at least the way in which we check it, is not a practical diagnostic okay because you have to culture the cells you have to have fairly sophisticated instrumentation it wouldn't be something that would be useful as a biomarker yeah is there a strong genetic component to it dementia in general if, you, if you're talking about deterministic sure thing only about one percent of alzheimer's disease can be explained by genetic abnormalities mm -hmm. Uh, if you talk to geneticists, they'll tell you it's 25 or 50 percent, but those are made up numbers. <laughs> OK, Okay. they really don't know that. So there are three genes that are really deterministic, and that's amyloid precursor protein itself, the precursor to the amyloid, uh, presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. And if you have mutations in those, it, you're very likely, well, essentially, you're going to develop the disease. Hmm. But those are rare families. I mean, they're well studied, but they're rare families and they generally have a very early onset. Yeah. The more common type of Alzheimer's disease, which is late onset, there's one genetic factor that's important. And that is um, apolipoprotein E. Mm -hmm. And it's not a deterministic thing. It's a risk factor. Right. And if you have an E4 allele of it, for most people, that increases their risk threefold. If they are homozygous for it, it might be tenfold. Mm -hmm. So while the population in the United States, about 20% of people have um, APOE4, that if you look at those people with Alzheimer's disease, you'd see over half have an E4. There's an enrichment. So it's that aside from APOE, there are other genetic factors, but their penetrance is very low mm -hmm. there and they are not particularly useful to understand things. I mean, there are genes of which variations in inflammation, et cetera, are associated with the disease. Yeah. And, and so fundamentally, then it is diet and lifestyle that you would attribute. That is really where that's been the major advance in Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. People realizing that Alzheimer's disease is much like other chronic conditions. And that is like heart disease or arthritis. It's a whole, it's all related to a whole lifetime of experiences. Yeah. So diet, exercise, mental state, like one of the most recent papers that just came out last week, was that if you have negative thoughts early in life, if you're, um, you may, you're at higher probability of developing disease. Mm -hmm. And that's a follow up of earlier work, which said depression was a good predictor of people that were going to develop Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at this, that's not so different than heart disease. Yeah. Yeah. You know, where genetics plays a role. But is, for most people, the genetics is just uh, part of the spectrum, you know, contributors. And, uh, you know, diet and exercise and positive living. And another clue that came out along this line 
was the difference between minorities. You know, like people now, when they're talking about the COVID, they say, oh, they're really surprised mm -hmm. that minorities had more COVID. Well, minorities have a lot of different issues. Uh, and you can't explain this all by genetics. Right. It has a lot to do with a lifetime of things that happen to different groups of people. And it isn't just diet. It isn't just exercise. It can be a feeling of stress in various ways, education, lots of things. Yeah, education seems interesting. So is there anything to this idea that if, if you're involved in a lot of different things, um, your chance of, uh, chance of Alzheimer's is lower, um, you know, implying that, you know, the brain is, uh, you know, maybe excess capacity, maybe high levels of plasticity, whatever it may be. If you're involved in a lot of different things as opposed to one specialty, your chances are lower. Is there anything to that? Well, there's definitely people that are socially and intellectually involved mm -hmm. are at lower risk. But, you know, you have to also look at this together with the fact that uh, one of the biggest risks for having Alzheimer's disease is living a long time. <laughs> right. And if you do any most of these things that uh, we're talking about, they will also increase your lifespan. Yeah. So you, really, you have to look at health span. So in other words, if, you know, if you can extend your life out to 95, your probability of having Alzheimer's disease is fairly high. But if you can, you know, increase the period in which you're completely healthy out to, you know, uh, 92, you know, that's probably the way most people now are thinking about uh, aging and health during aging. Right, right. Yeah, there's also some hypothesis around uh, the connection between uric acid, uh, which is uh, supposed to be um, uh, a powerful yes. oxidative. So gout at high levels of uric acid. Uh, I, yeah. I, I did one of the first connections and never published it, which is not <laughs> usual for me. Yeah. I, um, Hilary Kaprowski, a very famous scientist who died a number of years ago in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, he lived in 96. But he um, had done a study for multiple sclerosis. And he shared that study with me. And then we did together uh, looking at the Medicare database, yeah. inpatient database, uh, of people looking whether gout and Alzheimer's disease had co-occurrence. Mm -hmm. And we found that there was a 75% protection hmm. of gout. That's because you're correct. One of the most important antioxidants of the human body is uric acid. Yeah. Um, when we, the great apes, lost the ability to make vitamin C and uh, have also a mutation that, uh, that they cannot um, metabolize uric acid. Mm -hmm. So we accumulate this uric acid at very high levels, and it's an important antioxidant for us. It also causes gout. Right. And that was the surrogate. But um, in subsequent papers, not by me still, even I've sat in this data, what, 25 years probably, <laughs> is that, uh, and no one's done it the way we did it yet. Uh, I wouldn't say they did it better or worse, but we looked at 7.5 million people in our study. Oh, wow. The, okay. uh, well, it was the whole U.S. population. Yeah. Um, but, the, of course, the downside of this study was that, you know, it's the Medicare database, which is during the time period of the study, was not too impressive for Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. And that's still true. Mm -hmm. It's not very impressive for diagnosis. But nevertheless, there was an inverse relationship. And most studies have shown that. The other part of uric acid is that it comes from the metabolism of nucleic acids. Yeah. And um, nucleic acids, so we also looked at z uh, xanthine oxidase mm -hmm. and some other uh, metabolites and found they were changed during Alzheimer's disease. All of this unpublished. Mm. Yeah, so, so same thing with MLS and Parkinson's too, right? There is some protective effect of uric acid. 
We also looked in the study we did. We also did Parkinson's. We found the same. Yeah. So I'm talking about our data, not about other people's data. And also I compared uh, some other conditions where you wouldn't have expected protection. You know, just to find is, is this really a statistical anomaly? Yeah. And we looked at uh, maybe it's prostate cancer or something like that. And we didn't find that protection. You always have to wonder, though. I mean, this is the caveat when you're doing epidemiological type studies, is that people who have gout very often have high blood pressure. Yeah. Um, because the reason they get gout is not just that they have high uric acid, they have it because they are taking diuretics. Hmm. And that causes the water loss is what causes the uric acid to uh, crystallize in the joints. And that causes extreme pain. Right, right. Yeah, so it's all the comorbid issues there. Uh, it also mm-hmm. has some connection with the metabolic, other metabolic issues, right? Like type 2 diabetes and things like that as well. Correct, correct. So it didn't de- we didn't deal with any of that in this study. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would say the study theft had several of them to review. Um, and I wrote a commentary for one or two. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I thought it was interesting because when people are trying to take an- normal antioxidants, uh, you know, supplements. Yeah. Supplements do not have benefit for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, even though I take them, okay, I <laughs> take them as a placebo. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there's really no indications that uh, supplements have benefit, but food does. Right. And uh, and there's probably many reasons for this, none of which we understand very well. But one is that, is that um, I mean, the levels you see are just a lot higher. Like in uric acid, you're going to get an antioxidant that's going to be at a level that's much higher than ever normal any of those supplements are going to be. Yeah. And it doesn't tend to cause um, side reactions. Like vitamin C is both a reducer of oxidative stress and a producer of oxidative stress. Mm. Because most of the antioxidants taken as supplements are reducing agents. Right. And those reducing agents produce free radicals also. They do both. And uh, the other piece about the food, I think that Bruce Ames really hit it on the target. A lot of these things are working by homeopathic effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, by, um, uh, but by this, I don't mean by just placebo effect, that they are, um, they're working by um, inducing protective responses. When you eat plants, which is where the health benefits come from, mm-hmm. you're eating tons of toxins. Mm-hmm. And you may want to dwell that berries have lots of, um, you know, colors and there are lots of antioxidants, all true. Yeah. But the benefits could be from poisons that are in the <laughs> berries. Yeah. You know, sublethal poisons right. that induce. And one of my students did a lot of work on this, um, Paula Moreda who um, looked at the benefits of uh, low levels of cyanide Mm -hmm. and hypoxia, you know, not lethal cyanide, but where you um, stress the system. And that's also what Mark Mattson has talked about, exercise, dietary restriction. And I suspect that this is why every study that's looked at people that have um, plant-rich diets, Yep have benefits and, and those people who take supplements unless they're deficient, right. uh, have mild benefit, moderate benefit because the supplements probably depend on the person. You know, some people they probably benefit and some people they have negative. Another thing that's not really dealt with in this is that older people are not, you know, for the features I look at, mm-hmm. somebody who's 70 years old is not like somebody who's 30 years old. Mm-hmm. It's not just that they have wrinkles on their skin. <laughs> Throughout their um, body, if you look at redox active metals and things like this, in somebody who's 20 or 30, there's, we can't detect them. In somebody who's 60, you can detect them. 
-hmm. and uh, those, which means that they would respond differently to reducing agents like vitamin C. Yeah, there was some study, not, not study, but, you know, sort of a hypothesis that, um, that says that most of the diseases have some sort of a plumbing related issue that the body takes in a lot of toxins. It just cannot get rid of them and it gets accumulated wherever it can go. And over time, that's going to create all sorts of problems. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I know that idea. And that's the, that's kind of like the idea. What is it called? Well, the free radical theory of aging. Yeah. One of those is that the radicals cause cross-linked in proteins and those accumulate so cells become full of shit <laughs> and toxic shit and stuff like that. I, I really, the more I studied this, that aspect, the more I think it's not correct. Okay, okay. Um, because that idea is based on the idea that cells accumulate lipofusin mm -hmm. and lysosomal products. Yeah, we do see lysosomal products accumulate, but in, it's not, it's not, number one, they're mostly not cross-links. Yeah. We've made some of the very first reagents that can detect cross-links. And they're not present in lipofusin. They're hmm. present in other compartments of cells. So they're there. Um, and I, I think lipofusin is part of the detoxification pathways of cells. And as people age, hmm. that becomes more important. But cells can get rid of the stuff. But if they got rid of all of it, then they wouldn't have any place to put the stuff while they're getting rid of it. Right, right. Yeah. So, because I don't see that much difference in lipofusin between Alzheimer and control mm -hmm. in the quantity. If you look at EM, it's very subtle, the difference. They're larger. They're very different in the sense of um, uh, metals. Yeah. The um, lipofusin of uh, people with Alzheimer disease are full of um, iron containing particles, mm -hmm. magnetites. And normal people, especially young people, don't have that. Right. So they look very different. If you look at a, a high resolution piece, you know, if you ask really very, more specific question, but if you ask the gross question, is there just more lipofusin? Neurons are full with this stuff. I mean, it's, I, I'm trying to think of the number because I have the measure. Maybe it's up to 10% of the cytoplasm of a neuron. Hmm is full of shit <laughs> and that doesn't make sense either mm. uh, you know you can't why would you put in such an important cell something that does nothing right right yeah so for norm for normal people right. okay people that have mutations you know like batten's disease or some of these storage diseases i understand that then you can have accumulation because you have something that's not part of evolution mm. but you know people are really um well adapted people we're well-adapted organisms. That's why we're taking over the earth. We may have a population collapse in the future, mm -hmm. but, you know, we're everywhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. So in conclusion, then, George, um, if you look, uh, look forward five, 10 years from your research and elsewhere, where do you think we will be from an Alzheimer's disease uh, diagnostics and treatment perspective? Uh, I think in terms of diagnostics, I think that we're going to improve greatly mm -hmm. uh, because the imaging techniques continue to refine. Yeah. And uh, although the ones that are now the big advances may not be that useful from a public health standpoint because they're pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. They're a pet, you know, positron emission yeah. tomography. They require a lot of sophisticated instrumentation. They're very expensive. Um, but there will be biomarkers either from saliva or from uh, maybe cerebrospinal fluid mm -hmm. although i think that's not going to it'll have the same problem as pet it won't have general acceptance mm -hmm. throughout the world so i think there will be better diagnostics there's also a move to define the disease by biomarkers which i think is very negative mm -hmm. So negative in the sense that Alzheimer disease is a disease, a clinical disease. It's when people have cognitive problems mm -hmm. and uh, it's not when they have amyloid. Lots of people have amyloid in their brain are completely normal. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think 
I'm a little concerned about changing the definition to something that isn't clinically meaningful. Hmm. The part about treatment, it really depends on if the like if Biogen gets the approval, which I think is highly likely. Yeah. And they try refining something that's only going to work at the margins. Mm -hmm. So I've been critical of the amyloid theory since in writing, at least since the year 2000. Yeah. And uh, I never said it wouldn't completely work because you're dealing with a response. And if you modify that response in some way, yeah. maybe you increase it or change the timing, you might have an effect. But it isn't the primary driver of the disease. And that is, if it was the primary driver, you would expect if you removed it, which has been successfully done, the patients, at least some of the patients would show benefit. Yeah. None of the patients showed major benefit. They didn't promise the change in the um, decline of the patients. They promised that the patients would actually get better. Yeah, it would be very interesting to look at, you know, sort of the age-based uh, cross-section there, because if you're finding negative correlation between amyloid and oxidative stress, I would imagine sort of in the middle there, uh, removing... Uh... Ah, you, you're, you're exactly hitting on a paper I still haven't put together. Sorry. <laughs> you're hitting on the papers I haven't written. And that is, we looked at much earlier cases, like normal people, and look at amyloid. Yeah. And we found prior to having the disease, there's actually a positive relationship of amyloid to oxidative stress. Right. In other words, if you look at 50-year-old people and people like that, you see a weak positive relationship. And what happens is it changes when the people have onset of the disease. Mm -hmm. At mild cognitive impairment, there's a shift, which to us suggested the idea that Alzheimer's was a pleiotropic change mm -hmm. in the relationship of mitochondria, oxidative stress, and amyloid, and all those features, that where you move from where you have successful compensations during normal aging, and you have unsuccessful compensations after the onset of the disease. Right, right. And, but the, and, that, and that would fit with what people are saying in these trials that they started them too late, but they started in patients that were extremely early in the biogen. Pre-symptomatic people were included in the trials. Mm -hmm. And that's also been true for the dominantly inherited disease. The one in St. Louis, also failed. And those were also pre-symptomatic people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another trial ongoing in um, country of Columbia, mm -hmm. which genetically caused a disease. And again, pre-symptomatic. We don't know the results, but you know, you can guess that they can't be too spectacular because there's safety monitors. And if this uh, trial was extremely successful, they would break the code. Right. Right. Either it's not extremely bad or extremely good. <laughs> uh, so they might have a marginal effect. Right. But we really we really don't know at this point. Yeah. Yeah. This has been great, George. Um, th thanks so much for spending time with me and uh, good luck with everything that you do. OK, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.